All right, well, let's get to today's prophecy update. I sense that the Lord would have me share with you something that he had ministered to me in light of the events of last week and what a week it was. First, though, I hope you'll bear with me until we get to the conclusion of today's update, which is why I wanted to get to it. I want to sort of recap uh, the busy and I'll add grievous week that we just witnessed here in America. If you're anything like me, and I suspect you are, it was really a hard week. I found myself weeping more than once. Just a, such a difficult week. From the announcement by the FBI director, James Comey, at the beginning of the week, to the assassination of police officers, and everything in between towards the end of the week. And it's even ongoing uh, as we speak. I was watching uh, just this morning as the protests if you can imagine, continue. I suppose you could say that while we as Christians shouldn't be surprised or alarmed, it is at the very least very disturbing. Surprising, no. Disturbing, yes. I'll begin with what was arguably the most disturbing news from last week, starting with this Times of Israel report from yesterday. And you'll forgive me for quoting other news sources other than, if I can help it, other than domestic here in the U.S. because, again, you'll forgive me, but I, the, the media here in the United States of America is just, um, it's really bad. And it's getting worse, sadly. That's not to say that these other news sources are necessarily that much better, but they are certainly better than the news. Just to give you an example, I'm watching on my multiple TV screens as all of this is unfolding. And in the wake of five police officers being assassinated by this demon-possessed man, and he's a demon-possessed, was a demon-possessed man. You, you have to be demon-possessed to do what he did. CNN is focusing on the police who are, as we'll talk about here more in a moment, guilty without even having the opportunity to be proven innocent. And that's all they're, they're, they're showing. They're not showing the people who pulled over and stood up and honored this fallen hero whose life was taken by this demon-possessed man. They, were, they weren't showing that on CNN. They showed it on Fox, to their credit. But on CNN, they're showing the Bat Baton Rouge and the other, uh, I forget where it was that it took place. There was two of them last week, right? Well, the Times of Israel reports on how that thousands of protesters are continuing to take to the streets. They did so Friday and yesterday and even as of today as well, under the banner of peaceful protests. And this after what they're calling a black extremist, that's what they're calling him, shot dead five police officers during what was supposed to be a peaceful march against police brutality in Texas. While the White House ruled out any link between the gunmen and known terrorist organizations, there was a problem. The problem is, is that Micah Johnson's Facebook page ties him to a number of organizations listed as hate groups by the Southern Poverty Law Center, which studies such movements in the United States. Groups that he liked on Facebook include, you ready for this? the new Black Panther Party, and the Nation of Islam, both known for expressing virulently anti-Semitic and anti-white views. I don't know how much you know about the Nation of Islam, but its founder, one Louis Farrakhan, has many times preached 
to his Muslim congregation that, quote, white people know they deserve to die. This while he shouts, Allah u Akbar, which in Arabic means, not Allah is great, in Arabic it means, Allah is greater, greater. As the events of Thursday night and early Friday morning were unfolding, it was reported that Johnson had not only echoed Farrakhan's statements about white people, particularly white police officers who deserve to die. He also stated, and I found this very interesting, and perhaps you heard this as it was breaking. He also stated that, quote, the end was near. Close quote. What does he mean by that? What does he mean by that? Well, sadly, as is often the case when we're visited with evil of this nature, and we have been visited with evil once again. What gets lost in the mire of the madness is the fact that these were police officers that uphold the law. They were also fathers and husbands and brothers and sons. And if you don't mind, I want to take the opportunity to honor them and in so doing, ask you to pray for the police officers that we're blessed to have here in our church, all of whom I've had the privilege of getting to know. First, pictured here is Brent Thompson, a newlywed. Patrick Zamaripa, who did three tours in Iraq. Michael Kroll, who moved to Dallas to become a police officer. Mike Smiths, who leaves behind his wife of 17 years. And Lauren Ahrens, who was a 14-year veteran of the police force, also leaving behind a wife. As for the police officers that we have here at Calvary Chapel, Kaneohe, please pray, and I have their names on the screen, for Urban Bolibol, Paula Harris, and Art Kendall. By the way, uh, Urban is the one that you see in uniform. He does this of his own volition. He does special duty here at the church, not to scare anybody, unless you're a bad guy. We want to scare you. Be very afraid. Be very, very afraid. But we live in a very different world today, don't we? Clearly, police officers are under attack in this country. And we've talked about this before. Perhaps if the Lord presents the opportunity, we'll talk about it again. But I am of the belief that right now, what is under attack is anything that is a structured authority. Whether it's the authority of law enforcement, it is a dismantling and a destroying. Think about this. It, it, this is textbook divide and conquer. This is the tactic of the enemy, divide and conquer, and not just here in America, but in Israel too. Divide Jerusalem, conquer Israel. Div that's Zechariah 12. We've talked about that as well. Divide and conquer. That's, that's what's happening here. Th this is textbook, what's happening here. And regrettably, it's under the banner of rushing to judgment, pronouncing police officers guilty without even having a chance to be found innocent. Innocent until proven guilty is dead. It's dead. It doesn't exist. Make no mistake about it. You're kidding yourself if you do. You're burying your, your head in the sand if you do. Innocent until proven guilty is dead. And it's not even guilty until proven innocent. It's just guilty. Because see, if police, if law enforcement is guilty, well then we can just usher in Sharia law. That's what this is about. Oh, pastor, that's conspiracy theory, isn't it? Okay, whatever. Call it conspiracy theory, if you will. But that's what's going on behind the scenes. And please know, <laughs> our battle is not against flesh and blood. Our battle is not against black and white, Republican and Democrat, Christian and non-Christian. 
There are four entities that our battle is against, and Paul lists them in Ephesians 6, 12. He says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against, here's the first one, principalities. Number two, against powers. Number three, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. And number four, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Think about that. The Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthians said, don't be ignorant of Satan's devices. Satan is very cunning. Satan is very clever. And one of the most successful things that he's done is to get the focus off of him and to put it on flesh and blood. So now that Muslim neighbor is my enemy. And I, as the Christian, am in the enemy of the Muslim. The black is the enemy of the white. The white is the enemy of the black. The Republican is the enemy of the Democrat. The Democrat is the enemy of the Republican. And the list goes on and on and on ad nauseum. And Satan has succeeded. That's not the battle. That's not the fight. We don't fight a spiritual battle with carnal weaponry, Paul said. Our weapons are not carnal in nature. This is a spiritual battle. I think of Peter who whips out his sword when they come to arrest Jesus and he cuts off the ear of Malchus. And what does Jesus do? He turns to Peter, not with disgust or disdain, but with pity. Peter, you're in effect saying to him, you're fighting a, a spiritual battle with, with the weapons of the flesh. This is a spiritual battle that's taking place here, Peter. And you think it's a, it's a battle against flesh and blood? You think it's a battle against Malchus? Malchus isn't the enemy. The devil is the enemy. And that's the battle that's taking place here. Well, this brings us to the stunning announcement by the FBI director, James Comey, concerning Hillary Clinton's emails. Oh, he's going to get political now. Listen. <laughs> Well, uh, I don't have the time to... <laughs> I found this uh, Ruth Sheva article rather insightful. Again, out of Israel. It's titled, What FBI's Comey Could Not Say But Rashi Did. Let me quote. Yes, FBI Director James Comey admitted Hillary Clinton was careless and guilty of mishandling her email servers, but she was not guilty enough to be prosecuted. Guilty, but not guilty enough. That is the crux of it all. Let's make a quick dash to scriptures. About Sodom, we learn that people were rotten, but not completely. They were sneaky, according to this Rashi, but clever enough not to get caught. If, for example, it was against the law to steal ten apples, they stole only nine. Oh, okay. I see. It's a loophole. Let's just call it a loophole. It's a, a technicality. We couldn't establish intent. Okay. <laughs> Speaking of the U.S. State Department, whom I know all of us trust implicitly. I guess being clever enough to not get caught, <laughs> on the same day, they reported, Times of Israel reported on how the U.S. State Department accused Israel of systematically seizing Palestinian land. It seems that Maybe Israel is not as clever as the State Department. Apparently they're being accused and they're guilty, not till proven innocent, of stealing ten apples, it seems. But they're being accused of this seizing of Palestinian land. I'm going to go on record again and say, growing up as a kid, I was told that I was a Palestinian only to find out after I got saved that there's no such thing as a Palestinian. Before statehood, they called the Jews Palestinians. So it's not the Palestinians. We just talked about a Palestinian, Philistine. His name 
Well, let's call him the uncircumcised Philistine. Let's not call him by his name. He was a Philistine. He was a so-called Palestinian. There's no more Palestinians. They're called that because the land was called Palestine for almost 2,000 years. Philistia. That's why they call them Palestinians. The land does not belong to the so-called Palestinians. The land belongs to the Jews. The land belongs to Israel. And this is what Isaiah says about calling evil good and good evil. Well, the accusation came after the Jewish state okayed the construction of 800 housing units in the West Bank and East Jerusalem in the unusually strongly worded statement spokesman john kirby said the reports of new construction permits which came sunday as a response to two deadly terror attacks called into question israel's commitment to the two-state solution are you kidding me israel is being called into question concerning this so-called two-state solution the article goes on to say, if it's true, this report would be the latest step in what seems to be the systematic process of land seizures, settlement expansions, and legalization of outposts that is fundamentally undermining the prospects for a two-state solution. We oppose steps like these, which we believe are counterproductive, Kirby said. He added that Washington was, quote, deeply concerned about the move. The State Department statement followed a similar denunciation from UN Chief Ban Ki-moon. No surprise. This a day earlier. The UN leader is, quote, deeply disappointed that Israel's announcement came days after last week's release of a key report by the Middle East Diplomatic Quartet, the United States, European Union, Russia, and the United Nations that urged Israel to stop building settlements. A spokesman said in a statement on Monday. Here's the thing. Remember the so-called land for peace? Do you realize that when Ehud Barak was the prime minister, and when Yasser Arafat was still alive, and then President Bill Clinton met at Camp David, that Barak gave the Palestinians so-called all that they wanted, and they wouldn't take it. Why? Because they don't want a two-state solution. They don't want to live side by side with Israel. They want nothing less than the destruction of Israel. And here's the thing. I hope you know this. Israel knows this. Israel knows this. Gone are the days. Gone are the days when Israel, who finally woke up and smelled the Turkish coffee, beautiful, the best coffee over there, <laughs> woke up and smelled that coffee over there, <laughs> very strong, very strong by the way, you remember huh, when we were there, yeah, okay, I'm back now, I was, uh, sorry, but uh, they, wo they woke up and smelled that, that coffee and they realized that they can give all the land and it's not going to make any difference, so you know what, that's our land. And if we want to build settlements there, we're going to build settlements there. And you can condemn us. Nothing's new under the sun. You've been condemning us from the very beginning. You can condemn us all you want. That's our land. And we're going to build settlements there. So buzz off. Can I say that? Is that bad? Buzz off? Okay, I just did. I think you would agree that this administration has made it very clear and in no uncertain terms that they are not only vehemently against Israel, they're also against Christians. I, I, and it's evidenced by articles like this one from a Fox News op-ed piece by Todd Starnes. I really like this, Todd Starnes, by the way. It was on how some churches must now comply with transgender bathroom laws in Iowa. We saw this coming, right? Quoting this must-read article, and it is a must-read article. Is a church a place of public accommodation? And if so, are congregations required to follow anti-discrimination laws regarding gender and sexual orientation? 
That's the issue raised by a brochure published by the Iowa Civil Rights Commission. They contend that any church that opens its doors to the public would be required to comply with sexual orientation and gender identity laws. This ties into what I just mentioned. I'll, I'll quote the rest of the article as, as awful and, and horrific and, and even unthinkable as it is. But this ties in to what this is all about. This is not about wanting to be married. They don't care about being married. They don't want, quote, same-sex marriage. They want to destroy the institution of marriage. Let me connect the dots a little bit more. They don't want a state with Israel. They want the destruction of Israel. They don't want same-sex marriage. They want the destruction of marriage. They don't want the upholding of our law. They want the destruction of our law to bring in Sharia law. Are you seeing the, the pattern here? Do you see what's really going on here? And again, our battle is not against the politician. Our battle, as difficult as this may be to get your mind around for some, our battle is not against the LGBT community. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. But this is what the enemy is doing. And he's ramping it up because, as Revelation says, he knows he has but a short time. Well, quoting the article, Chelsea Human, First Liberty's chief of staff, told me the ramifications of Iowa's policy cannot be overstated. This is an un unprecedented move by a government agency to mandate that any time a church opens its doors to the public that it automatically qualifies as a place of public accommodation. Human said, and this is just the tip of the iceberg, attorney Human tells me that if the rules are enforced, it could lead to significant trouble for people of faith. That's you and me. The state claims it has the power to regulate what the church even teaches. <laughs> Not here they won't. What they are allowed to say from the pulpit, not this pulpit they won't. As God is my witness, I will never bow, I will never cower, and I will never give in. I will never give in. It will never happen. In addition to how they operate regarding matters of gender and sexuality, she said. If the church has a doctrine or theology that is at odds with the state, and they speak out about that, which we do every Sunday here, <laughs> they can have the full weight of the law brought down against them. I fear not man. I fear not what man can do unto me. I fear only the Lord. They have no fear of the Lord in their eyes. They have no fear of the Lord in their eyes. It gets worse. We're not done yet. Did you hear about this? I'm telling you, man, if this weren't disturbing enough, to add insult to injury, according to the Daily Caller on Friday, a California judge has ruled that the Christian dating website Christian Mingle, which is an online platform for single Christians seeking relationship, must now accommodate gay users. Two gay men in California brought a lawsuit against Christian Mingle's parent company, Spark Network, which also administers CatholicMingle.com, AdventistSinglesConnection.com, BlackSingles.com, and a mobile application, CrossPath. They alleged the site's failure to accommodate gay users violated the UNRWA Civil Rights Act, a state anti-discrimination law. And the network will also pay $9,000 to the two plaintiffs and reimburse them for attorney's fees. Now, let's, can we just connect one more dot? What are you going to say, no? <laughs> Listen, here's what's happening. Uh, they are wanting to destroy, they not flesh and blood, the enemy is using this to destroy the authority of the Christian church. That's what this is about. They don't want to use our bathrooms. They don't want to live side by side in peace and security in our restrooms. They want the destruction of our churches. They want the destruction of our churches. They want the destruction of Israel. How, how you package it, what wrapping paper you put around it makes no difference. 
What's inside is the same. That's the same. Okay. Here's the bottom line. The common denominator with everything that's happening in the world points to, and I know you know this is true, how that the world is neither our home nor is the world our hope. Yes, we are in the world, but we are never to be of the world. <laughs> How do I know if I'm of the world? You'll know you're of the world when you put your hope in the world. Is your hope here? If your hope is here, that means your home is here. And if your home is here, and your hope is here, then you're not only of the world, you're in the world. Actually, this is what the Lord administered to me. In light of all that is taking place, and I hope you understand that it's only going to get worse, right? In light of not only what's happened, but what is likely to happen in the weeks and months ahead as we occupy until he comes, and I know you've heard me say this before, but it's that of loosening our grip on this world. Now that might seem like a firm grasp of the obvious, but I think we do err greatly if we're holding on to this world and the things of this world like this instead of like this. Our, here's a question, and I ask it of myself. Believe me, I ask it of myself. <laughs> Are my roots down too deep in this temporal world that I'm in? Are my roots down too deep? Well, how, how will I know? You'll know if the mention of and the hope in the soon return of the Lord isn't welcomed. That means you're not ready. It's kind of like before my wife and I got married. I didn't want the Lord to come back until after we got married. And then after the honeymoon, I wanted the Lord to come back right away. And the same thing with kids, by the way. It took, took us so long. And I, I didn't want the Lord to come back until after our, our first son was born. And then after we didn't sleep ever again, I wanted the Lord to come back after. <laughs> but, right? I mean, when things are going good, we don't want the Lord to come back, right? Ah. Uh. Well, maybe for another time. I just think that sometimes God allows his people to get a glimpse into the reality of the condition of this world that we're in so that we will loosen our grip and we'll want to go. We'll, we'll want the rapture to take place. It, that's our only hope, right? Right? It, it, our hope is not in this year's election. I, I hope your hope isn't in with the way things are going. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you think that's going to change anything? I'll take it a step further, and we're almost done, and I appreciate your patience. I would suggest that for those of us here in the United States, we really need to loosen our grip on this country. Well, pastor, come on, man. That's not very patriotic. Listen, with all due respect, and I say this in love, I love this country more than most Americans love this country. My parents came to this country with $20 in their pocket to flee Islam. And they came here when I was nine months old. And were it not for them coming to America, I don't know that I would be alive, let alone saved. I love this country. I love this country so much. Still, it's still the best country. We're still living and basking in the glory of God's blessing on this, the once most powerful nation on earth. And if you don't believe that, go to Egypt. I don't recommend it. Go to my, my birthplace, Beirut, Lebanon. You won't make it. Just see what it's like in other parts of the world. You'll come back and you'll kiss this ground 
of this nation. Even though this nation has turned its back on God, God has still blessed this nation. And we're still enjoying the blessing of God on this nation. How much longer is it going to be this way? I don't know. Well, what are you saying? Well, know what I'm not saying. I am not saying that we give up hope in what the Lord could still do in America. <laughs> Listen, the Lord could still bring an awakening and a revival to this country. And if you're wondering how that fits with a pre-tribulation rapture, well, think about it like this. Let's just say, for purpose of discussion, there was an awakening in America, a revival in America, and multitudes came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ in America. Then the rapture happens. It would gut this nation out. There would be, it would be nothing like it is today because we're still here. And the world doesn't know that. The world wants to get rid of us. <laughs> they know not what they ask. We're the salt and the light. And once we're gone, whew. okay, we're, out of, your, we're out, of, out of your way now. You can have your new world order thing. <laughs> See ya. Wouldn't want to be ya. <laughs> I'm sorry if that's crass, but... Let me uh, close like I said I would five minutes ago. Um, <laughs> the fact of the matter is we have overstayed our welcome in a world, not our home. And I think this is becoming more evident as we see the hatred the world has for the Lord and the Lord's people. And again, it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. And please don't be taken back by this. Jesus in John's Gospel, chapter 15, verses 18 through 25, tells us why. Why the world hates us? The world hates us because the world hates him first. They hate us because of our association with the Savior. And that's why, and it's a badge of honor. Uh, James says, uh, flips it around to the other side, you're in trouble <laughs> if you're friendly with the world. Because you're at enmity with God. It's not, you, if you're at enmity with the world, it's a good indication that you're friends with God. You're not at enmity with God. Be aware when all men speak well of you. Let me just read one verse and we'll close in prayer. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, there it is, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Why don't you all stand we'll pray. If you have never called upon the name of the Lord, I would implore you today to make today the day of your salvation and to not put it off any, any further, any longer. Why would you want to take that risk? We're talking about eternity here. This isn't just about life and death. This is about eternal life. Why would you want to take the chance with eternity? If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you Romans 10, 13, which says, All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And you can do that before you leave here today. I hope you will. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that we're not of this world. Thank you, Lord, that we are only passing through, that this is not our final destination. Lord, I pray that if there's anybody here in this wonderful church that is my privilege to pastor that has never called upon you or somebody watching by way of the internet that has never called upon you I pray that today believing in their hearts confessing with their mouths that you Jesus are Lord of Lords and King of Kings that you were crucified buried and rose again from the grave that they today can be saved
one thought just the Lord has just, I believe, by the Holy Spirit put it on my heart. There's somebody watching, and you're in the Middle East, and you're watching this on YouTube. And when you do, the Lord will have spoken to you in such a powerful way that you today are going to surrender your life to Jesus Christ and walk with him and forsake Islam. Do that today. Do that now. I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.